Uh, my name is Brian Ramirez. I'm a uh, co-founder at The Graph, as well as a, uh, one of its co core developers, uh, Edge and Node. And today I'm going to be talking to you about the importance of uh, decentralizing the blockchain data supply chain, and specifically its importance to um, the Ethereum vision as well as the Ethereum roadmap uh, moving forward. So before we get into that, let's first things first. Like, What do we mean when we say the blockchain data supply chain? Simply put, it's everything that happens between you as a user sending a transaction to modify the state of the blockchain and another user reading that modified state based on the transaction that you sent. And at a high level, we can break that up into three kind of stages. You know, on the left, we have writing state. So it's everything that happens with you sending a transaction, getting it included uh, in a block on the canonical chain, which is through consensus. And then downstream of consensus, you have everything that's required for that state to be read for the various applications that you might use that state for, for example, on a decentralized application. Um, and I think most of us are probably more familiar with the right side of the supply chain because it's gotten a lot of attention in the last few years with things like MEV, um, some of the proposals like builder proposer separation and MEV boost. Um, so this is like an example of what the right side of the blockchain data supply chain uh, will look like in Ethereum in the future, you know, where you have a transaction going to a private or a public mempool, you have people bundling that into larger transaction bundles, uh, you have block builders that might be these specialized actors trying to kind of uh, extract as much MEV as possible, and then, you know, eventually it makes it to a proposer and validated uh, as part of consensus. Downstream, uh, of consensus, then we have everything that's required to get that data into a useful place for you to do something with it as a user. Broadly speaking, we can break that up into um, extract, transform, uh, and load. And you don't always need to uh, go through all those steps. Like for example, you know, JSON RPC uh, is a form of extraction. There's many use cases that just consume JSON RPC directly. Uh, many people today consume blockchain data through subgraphs, in which case they're using subgraph mappings as a transform step and then loading into a, a database or a store that's optimized for GraphQL queries. Uh, later in this talk, I'll be touching briefly upon uh, two technologies, Firehose and Substreams, which are next generation uh, versions of the Firehose and Extract uh, <laughs> logic in, in the, uh, the supply chain. We've got some uh, autonomous lights over here. At a high level, we can sort of categorize the different approaches to uh, decentralizing the blockchain data supply chain. Um, the first approach, and I would say for a long time, this was kind of the conventional thinking, was what we call Web 2.5. And in Web 2.5, basically what you're saying is, uh, we do all the things that we've been talking about you know, the last few years to decentralize the right side, so you know, protecting against MEV, keeping good stake decentralization, keeping good validator decentralization, but then downstream of that, we let the reads be, you know, through proprietary APIs, centralized servers, et cetera. Um, and I, I think the reason that uh, there's been so much more attention to the Web 2.5 vision is because failures on the right side of the supply chain tend to be a little bit more visible, or at least a little bit more intuitive. So if, like, you're getting your transactions censored from being included in, uh, you know, consensus, that's something that's going to be very apparent and you can point to. Um, Similarly, if there's actually like a determinism issue upstream of consensus, like some kind of data or execution inconsistencies, that's actually going to lead to a consensus failure, like a potentially like an unplanned chain split. And that's a very visible type of failure. And so I think, you know, rightfully so, there's been a lot of attention to everything sort of upstream uh, of consensus. But you can also have data inconsistencies, for example, downstream of consensus. That's some things that uh, actually our indexers uh, in the graph have like come across and helped debug. Um, but they just don't get as much attention because, uh, you know, inconsistencies in the way that you read data downstream of consensus impacts you as a user, but it doesn't show up in, for example, a, a consensus failure. So the other approach is the, what we call the Web3 approach. Web3, simply put, is full stack decentralization. In the context of the blockchain data supply chain, what that means is decentralized writes, like what we just talked about, but also decentralized reads. Um, a lot of my... Thinking on this is obviously influenced through my work on the graph, but I want to note that there's 
other projects in this space like Portal Network, Pocket Network, uh, TrueBlocks that are all taking varied approaches. Um, and I definitely recommend you checking out sort of you know this landscape of you know the decentralized uh, reads. So why do decentralized reads matter to the Ethereum vision or to the Web3 vision? I think we can start by just reasoning about it from first principles um, and like what it looks like to access a decentralized system through a centralized intermediary. By a quick show of hands, does anyone see something wrong with the diagram on uh, the right side of the screen? Well, I'm glad I can educate you today. <laughs> so, um, you know, what we're shown, showing on the right is basically a decentralized system, kind of on the top right, uh, being accessed through a centralized, you know, intermediary. So, like, so much of the work that you guys have heard about in the Ethereum ecosystem from the Ethereum researchers is really about maintaining decentralization at the blockchain layer, at, you know, uh, you know, at the consensus layer. And then what we've effectively done in many instances is taken this, you know, decentralized system with all its benefits, all its advantages, put it inside of a box, and then accessing that box through a centralized gatekeeper. And at that point, what's inside the box really becomes irrelevant, right? All the work that, uh, uh, that's been done to like, actually build this beautiful decentralized system is sort of opaque to the end user and to the applications that are built on top. Um, Afri, I think, put it really uh, concisely. He's one of the you know, early prominent Ethereum core developers that just, you know, if dApps are still accessing you know, uh, the blockchain through centralized you know, hosting, you know, then the Ethereum vision has effectively failed, is, is the, way that he, the way that he put it. I was working on an analogy to describe kind of the Web 2 dilemma, uh, and hopefully this isn't too soon, but one analogy that kind of made this stick for me a little bit is that if Web 2 is someone uh, sneezing on you during the pandemic, and Web 3 is a properly fitted N95 mask, then Web 2.5 is kind of like a chin diaper, right? And like, I know there's a lot of different uh, opinions and you know, ideas on the efficacy of you know, mask mandates, et cetera, but I think we can all agree that the chin diaper really didn't make a lot of sense. Uh, and that's kind of Web 2.5, right? It just doesn't make sense. It's sort of, uh, you know, it's incongruous with the goals of, of you know, blockchain and Web3. Uh, specifically, it undermines a lot of the value propositions that, you know, the Ethereum founders uh, and a lot of the early, you know, builders in Web3 sort of, uh, you know, united around in the first place. So, you know, being able to build unstoppable applications with composability, when you start building on centralized infra run by, you know, single service providers, well, then your app is no longer unstoppable. It stops as soon as you know, that platform gets shut down. Um, once you stop building on open standards, um, the composability of your applications and of the stuff that you've built goes down quite a bit. And even if there was a standardization on these centralized servers, there's a limit to how much composability you can get when you're building on centralized building blocks because the more centralized building blocks you compose, the more brittle your system becomes because now you're basically you know, if one centralized building block in your giant composed system goes out, well, now that ripples to breaking your entire system as opposed to, you know, unstoppable smart contracts running on Ethereum, the way those work, where, you know, a new DeFi protocol can come along, integrate with an existing unstoppable DeFi protocol, and that composition uh, can keep, you know, playing out until you get this, you know, this really rich tapestry of, you know, decentralized applications. Um, definitely hurts reusability, you know, if you're just doing one-offs all the time. Uh, and then I think, you know, on ownership, censorship, resistance, fairness, I'm going to try and paint this a, a little bit in, the, in a few examples. Uh, the first is, um, how many people saw the, the article that uh, Moxie Marlin Spike from Signal wrote earlier this year? Uh, okay, like, let's say 30%. So he, he wrote, a, I recommend you look it up. He wrote a very well-intentioned, well-thought-out critique of Web3 from someone actually trying to make a good faith attempt at building uh, some decentralized applications in the space. And so one of the things that he did was build an NFT app and to sort of uh, kick the tires on like the guarantees that we think we have when we're building on NFTs, he basically built a single NFT, but depending on where you viewed it, whether you viewed it on OpenSea, uh, Rarible, or in your own wallet, you got one of the three images shown on the screen. So like when you're actually buying the NFT or looking at it in a collection, you're seeing like this cool piece of artwork, and then by the time it makes it to your wallet, you get a poop emoji. And that's possible because the NFT was not hosted on decentralized uh, data, and using a decentralized data supply chain, it was using 
centralized servers to serve that, uh, that NFT, you know? And, and for a lot of us who are sort of inspired by the ownership vision of Web3, you know, that Web3 is enabling digital ownership, you know, how can we own things when the actual information artifacts that we're owning are controlled by centralized, you know, intermediaries? So this experiment also highlighted a, uh, a way in which we have censorship in, in quote unquote Web3 today. Um, because once uh, OpenSea realized that uh, Moxie had done this, they actually delisted uh, his NFT from OpenSea, which if OpenSea was doing that as an individual application and doing that for you know, sort of their own purposes, and I think that's you know, fine, like we believe in choice you know, at, the, at the level of projects and individuals. Um, but the problem was that so many other projects in the ecosystem were building on the OpenSea API that him getting delisted from the OpenSea application also made it so that the NFT stopped showing up in wallets and all these other places where you would expect to see an NFT that you had purchased, right? So this is a, a real example of censorship um, that's happened just this year in, in the context of you know, the blockchain data supply chain for a use case that we all, I think, care a lot about. Um, another one, that, this is a little bit more speculative, but I think it's an interesting one just as a thought experiment is, um, index or extractable value. This was an idea that was put forth by uh, someone in our community. Um, you can think of this as being a little bit analogous to like uh, MEV um, or also payment for order flow, which, is, which got a lot of attention this past uh, year or two when people realized that Robinhood's business model for offering free um, you know, stock trading to retail investors was that they sell the order flow to giant hedge funds like Citadel, and then Citadel with its privileged access to these uh, to this order flow can then like extract all this value at the expense of the retail investor. You could imagine a world where if we were all accessing the blockchain where we expect more of our financial lives to exist over time um, and we were all accessing it through a centralized intermediary, uh, that that centralized intermediary might gain a lot of alpha from you know, being the one that's seeing the sort of Google Trends style uh, you know, data around uh, accessing and querying you know, our financial lives as it exists on the blockchain. Okay, so that's kind of where the Web3 vision is at today and sort of the importance of, you know, the, uh, keeping the, the blockchain supply chain decentralized. Let's talk about where Ethereum is going and the ways in which a decentralized blockchain data supply chain supports that future vision. So for those that saw Vitalik's ETHCC talk earlier this year, you might have come across these new... Um, uh, let's call them work streams that are all happening in parallel. So, you know, they're not sequential milestones, but they're uh, all, all uh, parallelized work streams that are happening in the Ethereum ecosystem, the merge, the surge, the verge, and the splurge. Uh, and the diagram on the left can look a little intimidating. We're just going to focus uh, on a few aspects of this roadmap, um, specifically parts of the verge, uh, the purge, and um, parts of sort of the light client vision of Ethereum. So a brief overview, um, The Verge, one of its sub-goals is around supporting stateless clients. Uh, stateless clients allow validators to sort of be small and light while having like heavier uh, specialized builders uh, in the, you know, the right side of the blockchain data supply chain. There's different approaches to this, weak statelessness, strong statelessness. Uh, weak statelessness is where builders sort of uh, provide the, um, the witness of state that's being used by a transaction and strong statelessness, the end user actually when they submit a transaction, they would also have to submit the state that that transaction is gonna access uh, as a witness to the network. Um, the purge uh, is about history expiry as well as state expiry. So uh, EIP 44s uh, covers the history expiry side of things, which is the idea that after a certain amount of time, in, in contrast to the way that Ethereum works today, full nodes and validators would be allowed to drop, they'd allow, be allowed to prune historical blocks, um, uh, basically keeping the, the storage footprint of these nodes lighter. Uh, and then state expir expiry basically um, uh, attacks the unbounded state growth of Ethereum, where certain state, if it's not touched frequently enough, again, would be allowed to expire. Uh, and then light clients, uh, we're going to touch on a little bit in the next screen, but I think they're interesting to bring up here because they share a lot of the same requirements as sort of those previous two milestones. And they're also part of the solution space, right? Because a lot of this stuff boils down to being able to access state and, uh, and data. Uh, but the problem with light clients is that today, at least, 
light clients rely on altruism from the full nodes in the Ethereum network. So if those full nodes decide to support the light client protocol and, and serve data to these light clients, then it works out great. Uh, but the reality is that because of that lack of incentives, uh, as you know, Piper, one of the researchers working on this, noted, uh, basically the, the light client protocol in Ethereum is a vast desert of starved clients desperate for data. It, it's not working, right? It, it works nice in theory, but in practice you need incentives uh, or some way to make that data available to support these light client protocols, which, mind you, is very important to the vision, you know, Ethereum's founding vision of you know, decentralization. Um, so the common, the common threads, you know, without going too deep into the, uh, the weeds of any of these sort of proposals in the roadmap, there's some common threads that we can kind of uh, paint here uh, in terms of requirements. And it's basically that all of these proposals are going to need to uh, depend on some way of reliably, uh, efficiently, and verifiably accessing either historical blocks or pruned blocks from the, you know, the blockchain. Uh, or expired or uncached state. So in the case of state expiry, it's expired state. In the case of stateless uh, clients, it might be just state that the builder or the user needs that's not you know, cached locally. And the solution br uh, space breakdown here, I, I think, you know, can be broken into two larger categories. Uh, one is in s uh, financially incentivized approaches. So you we mentioned those like uh, those you know, light clients needing cooperation from the full nodes, which right now don't have an incentive. Um, so things like the graph, things like pocket network could fit into that category. Um, the other category here is using more like tit for tat incentives, which are not financial incentives, but this is kind of how like the BitTorrent network works, for example, where you know, if you're uh, being a good citizen in that network, uploading data as much as you're downloading, then uh, there's sort of this reciprocity you know, that you get. And that's the approach uh, being explored by uh, projects like Portal Network, um, using things like gossip protocols and, uh, and DHTs, which again are, are techniques from um, BitTorrent and, and now IPFS as well. Uh, and so why are we doing all this? Like, why are we getting rid of all this state? Why are we getting, you know, why are we doing it just for the fun of it? No, we're getting rid of this state and this history for a purpose, and that purpose is scaling Ethereum in a decentralized way. So. Simply put, what that means is being able to fit more transactions into a block, being able to have bigger blocks, while maintaining a small footprint for validating clients and, and light clients. And as an example of this, uh, one of the EIPs that's out there right now is called EIP 4488. It proposes a uh, approximately 5x cheaper, uh, 5x reduction in gas costs for call data. Um, this is about supporting like the Ethereum like rollup, uh, you know, centric future. Um, but the reason that they feel comfortable doing this, which was inevitably going to lead to bigger blocks or more full blocks, uh, is because it's intended to be paired with EIP 44s, which is one of the proposals in the purge, which is, uh, specifies dropping this requirement for full nodes and validator nodes to keep around all this historical blocks past a certain point. So that's what. All this really boils down to is decentralized scalability of Ethereum. Okay, so th this last one's kind of a bonus section. Uh, I think this is really interesting from uh, both a couple standpoints. One is that um, the fire hose, which we, we briefly noted earlier, is a next generation extraction technology. I think it's interesting, A, because I think it, it should impact the way that Ethereum clients get built in the future. Um, but I also think it's interesting because it's an example of sort of this uh, positive externality coming from an ecosystem that's tackling uh, the, the blockchain data supply chain in a decentralized open source way, right? So this is Firehose's technology uh, originally created by Streaming Fast, which is another core developer in the graph ecosystem. Um, before I get into how it works, it's worth um, calling out some of the problems with JSON RPC and the way that it works today. So, you know, most of you, I think, are show of hands, people that are familiar with JSON RPC. Okay, most people in the room. Uh, so this is how you access you know, data from like a Geth or an Aragon client today. Um, it basically depends on a running program to read data. So if you look at this diagram on the left, you kind of have this fan-in architecture where all the users are sort of hitting a running process. That process consumes CPU. Um, that process becomes the bottleneck uh, for getting data out of the node. 
And then because you need to have heavier nodes to serve all the data that people want, like archive nodes potentially running parity trace, it's also incredibly intensive on memory and solid state disks um, because in order to actually efficiently access that data, you need to provision a lot of, uh, of both of the latter. Um, it's difficult to get query intermediate state, so JSON RPC really only lets you query data as of a block. Um, you can get a little bit more by using the parity trace API, but it's still incomplete, also very cumbersome. It can be difficult to debug, so if you're using a, you know, a subscription to like ETH get logs, for example, via Infura, um, like we've encountered this you know, in our own stack that like sometimes you know, in the past, messages will just get dropped you know, due to you know, transient network events or partitions. Uh, and there's just no way to debug that. Like, you just miss the message, and like, uh, it's very, very difficult to figure out that, like, hey, a message you should have gotten never made it to you. Um, and there's a pretty incomplete verifiability story. Some of the, some of the data you, you want to get out, you can get a Merkle proof for, um, but other data, uh, like if you're using like the ETH get logs uh, interface, for example, there's not a really easy way to get a compact proof that says you didn't miss any logs you know, in, within some range of uh, within some range of blocks. Um, so what's the solution? Uh, we think the solution is the firehose approach. Uh, it's streaming first. So if you look at the diagram on the left, uh, data is being on, like as soon as it's available, it is being uh, broadcast out in a fan out approach rather than this fan in. It's being distributed uh, as flat protobuf files. So these can be distributed across uh, you know, commodity hardware, like, and using things like, you know, uh, Google Cloud Object Storage or Amazon S3, um, because, you know, now we have these distributed flat files, now we can start uh, parallelized workloads on those files, you know, all without even touching the blockchain node. So this is much more akin to, like, what you would see in, like, a Hadoop, uh, you know, big data architecture, where you have all these flat files distributed across commodity hardware, and then you have you know, these cl compute clusters that can be scaled independently and spin up concurrent and parallelized access um, for doing the sort of transform steps you know, on that data. Um, and so, so when you do that stuff, you get, you know, compared to the approach of using JSON RPC today, you, you, know, you get a one to two uh, order of magnitude you know, increase in read performance uh, based on the use case. Uh, there's a couple integration strategies that I'm going to uh, move through here real quick. Um, the first is just integrating this as a drop-in replacement for JSON RPC. Basically, have it be something that you know runs locally on the node. When you're running, you know, your node instead of accessing via JSON RPC, you would be using sort of like the Firehose stack, and that's kind of like a really basic uh, integration. Um, but in the future, you you also might want to actually um, improve the verifiability guarantees that you get from Firehose. So, you know. Uh, you could imagine sort of the Firehose instrumentation logic running as a WASM process that is um, implemented as a read-oriented rollup, so like an optimistic rollup or even a ZK rollup um, that actually uh, gives you some guarantees on the validity of the sort of uh, data that is extracted through that Firehose instrumentation process. Um, and then the final approach that, you know, and again, these are still very early in, in us thinking about this, but the final approach is you could even potentially integrate Firehose files into the consensus process itself. Now, you probably wouldn't want to do that um, initially because initially there's a, a strong benefit to having what's called like data agility, being able to evolve the schema, evolve the instrumentation logic based on sort of a changing understanding of what's needed. But as those integrations stabilize, there might come a time and point where blockchain core developers decide to say, "Hey, we'll you know we'll reference you know a maybe the Firehose uh, files from the previous epoch you know at some future block, right? So that they're actually you have some guarantees natively in consensus." Uh, I'm happy to announce that uh, actually we have our first uh, example recently of a blockchain core development team um, self-serving their Firehose integration. And I think this is going to be really important for every blockchain core development team, uh, especially in including the you know, Ethereum ecosystem to eventually own their Firehose deployment um, so that they can sort of maintain that for their own use cases. And then that also has secondary benefits like basically automatic integration with protocols like the graph. Um, there's another uh, integration story here uh, related to EIP44 called Shim Clients, but we're out of time, so if you're interested in that, uh, you know, feel free to come up to me and find me afterwards. Um, highly recommend checking out uh, Alex B from Streaming Fast's talk this week on substreams. 
Uh, and then also Vincent from Masari has a talk on standardized um, subgraphs, but they're heavily using firehose and substreams as part of their uh, as part of their dog fooding. So yeah, thank you guys very much. Uh, that's my talk. Do we have time for questions, or I, I guess we have time for a couple questions. We have a mic in the back. Is, is there a published specification for the firehose? Fire there's fire. there's pretty detailed documentation. Um, I wouldn't say it's a, at the level of like an IEEE spec or anything like that, but there's very detailed documentation on the architecture, how it works. The repos are open source. Um, so if you just search like firehose, the graph, docs, uh, uh, you'll, you'll find it real quickly. Yeah, Dave in the front. So for, oh, thank you. For the, um, the stateless clients in like EIP 4444, is there any way to estimate or predict like how, like basically what I'm trying to understand, like can the graph network itself as a whole essentially like earn income from providing a service of like, you know, basically the, the current Ethereum nodes retiring the state, but then graph nodes serving up that. And then as a whole, like the network getting some profitability from that. Yeah, it's a really good question. So this is, um, these are sort of emerging ideas in our ecosystem, but like increasingly my view of the graph um, uh, is that it is gonna be like a multi-service uh, ecosystem. So like today the primary service is, you know, you do ETL into a subgraph and query it via GraphQL, um, but there might be a range of services, for example, accessing Firehose data directly or JSON RPC data directly or data in a key value store or a SQL store. Um, and I think all of those could potentially be supported side by side in different like namespaces, if you will, within the graph ecosystem. And in that context, then you could imagine, yes, graph indexers and service providers being the um, the endpoint that like light clients use to uh, to get their data. It could also be what blockchain nodes themselves use to hydrate, uh, you know, data and some of these other um, you know related to these other milestones. So yeah, I think it, I think it will be a source of. Uh, query volume, you know, in the future on the graph. Yeah, great question. Cool, I think that's it. Thank you guys so much for your time and attention.